with Charles, Charles and there's world checking in. We are delving into uh, hip hop legend Scarface's biography, Diary of a Madman, Brad Scarface Jordan. It's a really good, really good book, man. Y'all can check it out on Audible, but I'm gonna play a little excerpt from it. Then I'm gonna come back with my reaction. That thumbs up button. Houston and hip hop. People always talk about their rap Mount Rushmore. You know, the four MCs they'd carve in stone as being at the top of the game. But it would be impossible for me to name all of my influences. Real talk, if I ever had to do that, you'd have to give me much more than a mountain. You'd have to give me a whole goddamn mountain range. My top four would turn into a top 10, which would turn into a top 20, which would turn into a top 50. And the next thing you'd know, the whole fucking Rockies would be cut up with faces of my favorite MCs. Every single rapper that came before me, good or bad, and even the ones that came after me have all helped to mold me into the artist that I was then and the artist that I am today. For real. So for me to talk about my influences, you'd have to go all the way back to the very beginning, to the Sugar Hill Gang and Rapper's Delight, Curtis Blow, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Melly Mel, and cast like that. They brought a new style, a whole new avenue of music to the world. Those were the forefathers of the genre. They created hip hop, and it was revolutionary. Without them, I wouldn't be me, because when they brought it, it was like, damn, I really want to do this. But if they laid the foundation, what really made me want to take it seriously was hearing highly skilled MCs like Cool G Rap, Big Daddy Kane, Rakim, and Chuck D really pushing the form with their wordplay and rhyme patterns and bringing their unique voices and deliveries to the game. They were all so sick and so sharp, just straight killers on the mic. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be Chuck D, Rakim, and Big Daddy Kane balled into one. Give me Chuck's delivery, Kane's skills, and Rakim's rhyme style, plus Willie D's content? That's what molded me. I wanted to talk shit, be political, and spit some gangster-ass shit. That's what I was after. And then Ice Cube came along and fucked the whole game up. As soon as I heard Straight Outta Compton, I knew that was the music I wanted to make. In fact, that's the song that inspired me to make Scarface. It was just so raw and so mean. And Cube was a beast. He had the whole package. His wordplay was tight. He had a great voice. He spoke straight to the streets. And his raps were tough as a motherfucker. I loved Ice Cube. He was a little older than me. And I know a lot of dudes won't admit to trying to emulate other people or to trying to follow in the footsteps of someone. But I looked up to him growing up. I really think he's a better rapper than I am. There were a couple of guys that I really looked up to. Guys like Big Daddy Kane, Chubb Rock, Chuck D, and Ice Cube. Those were my classmates in my mind, my contemporaries. If I was going to be compared to anyone, I wanted to be compared to them. But beyond that, my motivation really came down to two things. I wanted to live like James, and I wanted to rap like Ice Cube. If I could pull that off, I knew I'd be good. I remember going to L.A. and hanging out with Cube for the first time. He had a black Nissan 300ZX. Shit, as soon as I got home, I bought a red one. Then I remember being in L.A. working on one of my solo albums, and I ran into Cube and he had a black BMW, one of the newer models. As soon as I got home, I went and bought myself a white one. I wasn't biting, but Cube was doing it for real, and I was definitely taking notes. I know everyone's always made a big deal about us being from the South, but I was never really concerned about where I was from. Not like that. When we were coming out, there was definitely a New York bias in hip hop, but I always thought New York had a legitimate claim. They created the shit and everyone else was following. They got to dictate the terms. I'm not saying it was fresh to just write someone off because of where they were from, but New York had set the bar and if you didn't hit that bar or raise it, then that was on you. At least, that's how I was looking at it. I didn't give a fuck that I was from Houston. If I had been from New York or California, I wouldn't have given a shit about that either. I didn't want to be categorized. 
I just wanted to be a part of what was going on, and I wanted to be taken seriously at the same time. I always felt like assigning a region to the music me and the Ghetto Boys were making was just another way of pushing us to the side, or somehow putting us off or putting us down. And I wasn't with that shit. Don't judge or put a value on my music simply because of where I'm from, or tell me you think my shit is dope for something coming out of the South. That shit is insulting to me. If my music is good, fuck with it. If you have a problem with the music I'm making, fuck you then. Don't like me or dislike me because I'm from Texas. Like me or dislike me because of the music I make and the way I rap and what I rap about and how I bring it. And if you can't appreciate me for that, then I can't help you. I'm not interested in being the best in the South. I'm interested in being the best. And I think that was the attitude for all of us from J on down. We didn't want to make the best music out of the South. We wanted to make the best music, period. To the point where you had to fuck with us no matter where you were from. And we worked our asses off to make that true. Back in those early days, there wasn't a lot of shit coming out of Houston. The city, like the rest of the South outside of the shit Luke was doing with Two Live Crew and Miami Bass, was kind of dead. Anything coming out of Houston sounded like a bunch of kids doing nursery rhymes. Motherfuckers might as well have been rapping the alphabet compared to the shit coming out of New York. It was just a whole different animal. Our only real outlet for hip-hop was this radio show, Kids Jam, which was on Texas Southern University's KTSU. This was pre-internet, so it would take forever for records to get down to us. But Kids Jam was jamming. It was on every Saturday morning from 10 to 2, and it had some of the best DJs in town, including Terry T, who went on to be the rapper King T, Marcus Love, and Lester Sir Pace. Jazzy Red also DJed up there for a bit. Kids Jam was the one place we could hear all of the new music, both national and local. And even though it was called Kids Jam, they played all of the grimy street shit that we all wanted to hear. I bet it was one of Houston's most highly rated radio shows back then. It felt like the whole damn city was tuned in. The other big outlet for us was a local DJ, Daryl Scott. Daryl was from the Third Ward, and he was a mixtape king. He ran the city in the early 80s, DJing all of the hottest clubs and hustling his mixtapes all over town. He would take all of the latest records, all of the shit you couldn't hear on the local stations like Magic 102 and Love 94, and he'd mix them all together with this technique he invented called the chop, which was like a short stab of sound from the records, longer and heavier than a typical DJ scratch, rather than a smooth blend. The radio was playing shit like The Message or Rapper's Delight, but if you wanted to hear Scorpios or Kumo D or shit like that, you either had to turn on Kids Jam or get you a Daryl Scott tape. And Daryl's tapes were dope. He had a shitload of them too. You know, editions 1 through 15, through 23, through 23 and a half, and on and on. And he made a killing. If you had $10 to either buy an album or a Daryl Scott tape, you were getting the tape. He was platinum in the hood before platinum was platinum just from pushing those tapes all over town. Motherfuckers all over the world know Houston for screw tapes, but it was Daryl who really made Houston mixtapes a thing. Daryl chopped them up, and then Screw came on the scene and slowed them down, and it was the marriage of those two styles that gave Houston mixtapes their sound. Now, if you want a screwed version of something new, you're going to get it chopped and screwed or chopped and slopped. Either way, that chop is going to be in the mix. When it came to FM radio, though, that shit was a mess. Hip-hop was so far from getting spins back then, I'm not even sure they played LL Cool J. Good fucking luck hearing anything local. The only people who really looked out were Jimmy Olsen, who was a DJ on KISS 98.5, and Greg Street, who was at Magic 102. They broke the Ghetto Boys locally. After the Ghetto Boys came out with Car Freaks, that's Ghetto with the H before me and Willie got down with the group, the next big record out of Houston was Captain Jack's Jack It Up. He was signed to rap a lot at one point, but that didn't last. Then R.P. Cola came through with The Cabbage Patch Dance, and that's when the scene started to grow. K. Reno was out here really early doing it, and so was Raheem. 
Gangsta Nip and Big Mellow started making noise not too long afterward. Then the Ghetto Boys dropped Making Trouble in early 1988. Anyway, y'all, this is Diary of a Madman. Brad Scarface Jordan. This is a really good book, man. Dude. Really deep, intricate part about hip hop. He's, a, he's not only is hit Scarface a legend in hip hop, he's also a, still a student. You know, I too was influenced by Ice Cube as well. Uh, I used to think Ice Cube was so cool back in the day. You know what I'm saying? And he had the Jerry Curl and shit. Ice Cube was hard, you know. Still is one of the OGs of hip hop. But uh, I, I thought they was around the same age. I ain't know Ice Cube was older than Scarface. I know that. Anyway, if y'all want to check out this book, you can check it out on uh, on Audible. And uh, yeah, give me a thumbs up button and leave some comments. What y'all think about what y'all just heard?